Oh, no. Okay, admit all. Okay. Sorry about that. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Central Coast Local Planning Panel. Um, my apologies for the delay in starting. Uh, Council's having some difficulty with its live streaming um, IT. We are recording this meeting as we always do, but the, the live stream is not working. So um, we'll arrange to, to put the recording up um, if, if we need to do that. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today, especially the Darkenjung speaking people of the Central Coast Council area, and um, also pay respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, Obviously, given that the meeting's being recorded, et cetera, there shouldn't be any other recording of the meeting. Um, be good if people could stay on silent unless it's their turn to speak, please. Um, okay, the people on the panel today are myself, Donna Rygate as, as the chair, uh, Greg Flynn and Stephen Leithley, who are our expert professional panel members, and Lynn Hunt, who is our community panel member. So welcome to all of you. Um, we're considering two applications that um, meet the criteria for a public meeting today, um, a Kurung Street at Long Beach matter mm -hmm. and um, Mulloway Road, Chain Valley Bay. Um, we've been provided with assessment reports prepared by council staff. We've also done site orientation um, and we've had briefings from, from the council staff um, and, and received information on key issues raised in the applications. We've got a, a number of people registered to speak today. Um, in relation to the Etalong matter, Lynn Robertson, who I believe is, is might be joining us just on the phone rather than by video. Um, Francis Whiffen and uh, Sandra Trad on behalf of the applicant. Um, and in relation to the Chain Valley Bay matter, we have a number of people who I think uh, probably all on behalf of the applicant, um, Ian Benson, Joseph War, Stephanie Van Dissel, Jason Yo, and Stuart Greville. So how, how this works, is, most of you probably already know this, is that it's the opportunity for the panel to hear from members of the public and from applicants for us to ask questions of those people if we need to, to clarify our understanding. Um, Members of the public get um, each get three minutes to speak and um, applicants representatives get a collective 15 minutes to um, to respond. Um, the panel might ask questions of the speakers to clarify our understanding of, of things that are being said or, or whatever. All right, we'll get we'll get started on the formalities. Declarations of interest. Panel members are well aware of the requirements of the code of conduct, um, and declaration forms have been submitted. There haven't been any conflicts identified. Does anybody have anything that's come up at the last minute that they wish to uh, to declare in addition to the written declarations? Nope. Okay, no. fantastic. Um, we've got the minutes of a uh, a previous meeting um, that have been. Uh, been submitted for us to note. Are people happy to note those minutes? Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll uh, we'll get on to the the speakers, and um, I will ask Lynn Robertson to please um, address the panel in relation to the um, Etalong Beach application. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Oh, good. Thank you for that, Donna. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the applicants for amending the original plan. Um, however, I find that the amendments are quite minimal and the development still lacks thought to the amenity of the future occupants and the environment in general. Uh, one of my main concerns with this CA is that it is, does not meet the following R1 objectives to provide for the housing needs of the community, nor does that provide for a variety of housing types and densities. It has been established that this area needs one bedroom and two bedroom dwellings to provide more affordable housing and housing for older people. Currently on the peninsula, we've been inundated with three bedroom multi-dwellings squeezed onto small blocks of land with little or no amenity provided for a family, which I presume is what a three bedroom dwelling is designed for, 
um, that the size of this land is better suited to a variety of unit sizes. It could then be easily compliant and provide the actual housing needs of our community and would also mean that there'd be more room for deep soil planting and trees, which we badly need in this area to improve the health of our local environment, which is well known as a heat island. Indeed, Edelong is known to have the highest heat impact on the peninsula. Another concern is the driveway with so much concrete and the fact that there is no landscape plan provided for public exhibition. Does it at least include some planting along the fence down the side in line with the cow arches to break up all this concrete? Don't know, can't see it on the plan. Overall, I find this DA still badly designed with two units facing south and the lack of sunlight is will incur for them. Unit two will get some morning sun, but not sure if enough, and unit three will get very minimal sunlight. The depth of the private open space of unit three is concerning as well. Space is south and it's so low down from the unit, you have to step down, like I can't remember, I think it's five or six steps, which will mean it will not even dry washing, never mind be pleasant to spend time in. Um, basically, that's all. Yeah, I have to say on the matter at the moment. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank um, you. Now I'd like to invite Francis Whiffen to uh, to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm here this afternoon representing the Peninsula Residents Association, as was Lynn. <clears throat> We're quite concerned at the continuing trend towards expediting approvals of virtually any kind of development. Um, this is apparently justified by the urgent need for more housing on the peninsula. Uh, Lynn's actually covered the type of housing that's actually needed on the peninsula, which can be found in the, um, the council's, the Central Coast Council's LHS document, Local Housing Strategy, which, you know, covers the need for housing for elderly people and affordable housing, or one or two bedrooms, all the rest of it. Um, but getting on to this particular application, I'm very disappointed that set of diagrams were not included in the public exhibition. Um, I was also a bit disappointed in the presentation of the plan. It's very, very crammed with information of all different kinds. You know, you've got levels, you've got the layout of the old, the old um, existing place, you've got this place on top of that. It's just, it's very, very difficult for the average person to um, decipher. So, so overall, the public exhibition is, is, you know, falls short on several regards. In regard to the shadow diagrams, the DCP actually states that shadow diagrams must be provided for developments two stories or more. It doesn't say that these are for the eyes of the council plan only and are to be withheld from public exhibition. Hmm. So in this case, I prepared my own shadow diagrams and attached them to my submission. That was for the original <clears throat> un, unchanged version. As it turns out, my many years of working in architectural drawing offices were obviously wasted, as the assessment report states that the POS for Unit 3 will receive three hours of sunlight to 50% of its area on June the 21st, 21st <laughs> contrary to my diagrams. So this morning I sent another set of shadow diagrams to the panel, hoping to clarify the situation. I don't know if the panel's received them or had a look at them. But um, basically, no. The, the pause for Unit 3 will not receive three hours of sunlight. Be lucky to get half an hour of, of sunlight to 50% of the pause area. Um, that side, it's 36 Kurong Street, is almost aligned north-south. It's about 15.3 degrees off. If you imagine a clock face with two north at 12, at 12 o'clock, then Woi Woi North, as I like to call it, would be two and a half minutes to 12. And that's the alignment of this site. So it's almost facing north, but not quite. Not only will the back end of this development be in the shade for most of the day, but according to the civil engineering drawings, there's a significant drop as Lynn mentioned, in the level to the service of the pause, the FFL of Unit oh. 3. Sorry. That's time. Sorry. You're shown at 4.96. Can I just go on for a bit longer? Yeah, look, Mr. Whiffen, I'm, I'm happy to, to give you a little bit of latitude. No problem at all. Thank you. Um, 
the, the, is shown at 4.96. The middle contour of the pars is shown at um, 3.4, a drop in level of 1.54 meters. This pars would be most unappealing, as Lynn has said. Now, one last thing is the, is the Nathurst star ratings, which are very, very low at 5.7 considering that six is the minimum you're supposed to have in the whole rest of the country, any other state but New South Wales, six stars is considered the minimum. It's not good rating, it's mediocre. But anything below that is substandard, and that's what this thing has achieved. It's got an average rating now of 5.7. Since the changes were made, it's been regenerated. It was 5.4 stars. Um, surely this points to some sort of shortfall in the thermal design. It's very important these days, um, you know, with electricity prices going up crazily, that um, the, the, the thermal efficiency is a very important part of the design. And not, not just that, but also for solar panels. Uh, this design doesn't seem to really allow very much for them. It's got two flat roofs with, with um, presumably parapets around them. It'd be very difficult to put flat panels on. And the garage area in between would be shaded by the two-story bit, mostly. So, um, yes, I could go on, but I guess I better not take too much of advantage. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I might move on now to Sandra Trad on behalf of the applicant. Um, are you there, Sandra? Yeah. Thanks, Donna. Okay. Thank you. Can everyone hear me right? Yep. 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 Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, thank you to Francis and Lynn for speaking. I appreciate uh, the time that they've taken um, to actually attend the meeting. Um, firstly, I'd like to state that the design process for this project actually commenced in mid-2021, uh, and initially the design adhered to the relevant rules and regulations under the Gosford LEP 2014 and uh, the DCP, the Gosford DCP 2013, which were in effect at the time. While the new Central Coast LEP and DCP 2020 uh, two didn't come into effect until August 1st, 2022. The design had already been completed and we had submitted uh, the plans, I think, on the 1st or 2nd of September. Uh, now, having said that, I've had the opportunity to review some of the submissions, which raised objections to the design plans. Um, a, a lot of the, uh, the comments that I've heard today from Lynn and Francis uh, you know, will be addressed with these points as well. Now, I'll address them point by point just briefly um, to get through them. Uh, number one is parking. Uh, so I've had several submissions comment on the fact that there's only five parking spaces, but we have updated the plans to include a visitor's car, car space in addition to the previously designed five uh, car spaces. So there are now six parking spaces in total. This is in line with the current DCP. Um, the tree removal. As part of the DA, we submitted an arborist report from Advanced uh, Treescape Consulting by Russell Kingdom. The report supports the removal of two existing trees on site. However, the landscape plans, which have been provided with the architect tools, um, include the provision of two large trees to replace those that are removed. Um, and in addition to the only other tree that will be impacted is a street tree, which uh, councils in support of its removal and replacement. So it will be replaced. Overshadowing. Um, as with any housing structure, there will always be some level of overshadowing that will occur throughout the day, uh, which affect the neighbouring properties. Um, in this case, namely number 34, who are the neighbours to the east. However, a minimum of three hours is maintained to both the dwelling and the private open space. Um, it clearly shows that on the shadow plans in the um, architecturals, and it will comfortably meet that criteria. Private open spaces. The private open space is met by two of the units. Units uh, Unit two contains almost 18% more open space than required. And unit three contains almost 9% more open space than required. So the first unit only falls short by 0.03 meters squared, which amounts to less than a 1% variation. Um, as a whole, the development proposes substantially more private open space on the property than is required. Uh, setbacks. 
which is number five. Based on the updated plans, the only non-compliance is a front setback, which is measured at 7.02 metres. The required front setback based on the current DCP requires um, an average of the two neighbours, which is 8.45 metres. However, that setback would hinder the private open spaces to units two and three unnecessarily. In addition, the neighbouring property number 34 has a front setback of more than 10 metres, which is considered excessive for the purposes of averages, if we were to consider it. Um, Amenity impacts. The proposed design provides new dwellings to the area, which include well-designed internal layouts, larger than required open spaces and comfortable parking spaces for residents and visitors alike. This means the development will have an overall positive impact um, on the local amenities and surrounding community. Now, just to add uh, to that, I know that there, there was mention of the landscaping plan and the shadow diagrams not being included in the notification plans. Um, obviously, we have no control over that. The notification plans consist of a site plan and elevations. Um, that's what, you know, we uh, that is what we need to provide. And um, the rest is up to council what they do when I put up um, our for public exhibition. So, um, Sandra, can I just ask you to just yeah, sure. hold for a second? I, somebody's got their, yeah, it's so not on mute, and we can hear your background noise. Yeah. Someone talking in the background, someone who's on net, N E T S A N E T, please get yourself on mute. Or if they can't do it, Lisa, can you do it for them? Yep, it's all sorted now. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. Somebody called N E T S A N E T. Please. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, okay, Sandra, where you go again? Sorry about that. But no, you're all right. Um, actually, that's it from me. Um, I've addressed the points that I found a thing, and yeah, willing to hear from. If there is any questions, anyone wants to ask me anything, I'm happy to. Okay. Oh, well, that was a convenient stoppage then. That was yeah. amazing, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Members of the panel, what questions do you have for Sandra or indeed our um, community speakers? Can I go ahead? Yes, please, Lynn. That would be lovely. Okay. Sandra, I was just wondering, um, uh, Lynn Robinson had had mentioned that uh, I had asked about landscaping along the fence as a minimum um, because the driveway was going to be um, very concretey. Is that something that can be addressed? I haven't seen the landscaping plans. Um, uh, yeah. So what I can do is is um, am I able to share a screen on this or on, or no? Um, you could try. Yes. I'll, I'll um, just oh, change yeah. it for you. Um, can you do that now? Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'll just share. I don't know if you can see it now, but this is the landscape plan that we have provided. Um, yes. And there's landscaping all along the side of the driveway there. Um, right. To, okay. To, yeah, just to screen the retaining wall as well and to soften its impact. It doesn't go right to the end, right to the street, though, does it? I see. Is it just oh, got a little bit of... Oh, no, but that's only because um, the uh, the tree officers uh, and the engineers and council asked us to remove them uh, because we needed to provide the site triangles. So these need to be clear for um, for vehicles, yep. um, for okay. the vision. Yeah, so that's why we weren't, we weren't able to provide any landscaping along this side of this corner there. Or Thank you. we have to leave that clear. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Anything else, Lynn? No, I think we, we we asked about the replacement trees. I, I believe there is a minimum um, size that has the replacement tree has to be because of the removal of the street tree, and I, that's clear now to me. Okay. All right, Greg or Stephen, do you have any questions for any of our speakers this afternoon? Um, yes, uh, to Sandra. Um, I understood from the report there was a condition requiring curb and gutter and the footpath, but I just can't seem to locate it in the <clears throat> conditions at the at the moment. Are you aware of that condition at all, Sandra? The curb and gutter? Yeah. 
uh, yeah, so that's um, standard with most applications um, that don't um, for developments that don't actually already have a uh, curb and gutter. So, and in this case, uh, the site doesn't already have one. So what our engineers um, do for the preliminary designs is they design the driveway and they include the curb and gutter as part of, um, you know, council regulations, because we do, for any new development, we need to provide a curb and gutter to the streets. I don't know. I think we've just been through that today in our briefings with the council staff. I don't think there's actually a policy on it. It's more a practice that they require. So you have no objection to providing the curb and gutter and the footpath across the frontage of the site? No. Thank you. Yeah. Nothing else, Stephen? No? Greg? Um, yeah. Uh, Chair, um, I haven't got any questions for the people who made submission, but it was more one of the issues raised by Mr. Whippen on overshadowing. I was just wanted to ask the staff about stopping the report. Is that okay? Or yeah, I'm not sure which staff member I actually ask. <laughs> Is that possibly? I, uh, I just made. I'll, I'll just raise or it. Elsa, I think. Or, or Amy, yeah. or and um, I'm sure Sandra can also provide more. But Amy, first, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, Amy, on page 19, you heard Mr. Whiffin's um, comment on overshadowing, and he, he feels that the report's not quite correct with regards to the statements, but it says on page 19 that uh, under sunlight access, that sunlight minimum three hours in living, dining, family rooms, and 50% of principal open space areas, sunlight's retained to existing neighbours. It says the shadow diagrams have been provided, to demonstrate the maximum levels of sunlight that can be achieved. It says it complies and it complies with the objectives. Um, is that, is that, is that, you haven't changed your opinion of that based on what was any any changes with regards to Mr. Whippen's comment? No, I haven't. Okay. And so the other question is, uh, Mr. Whippen said the shadow diagrams weren't publicly exhibited, weren't they part of the documentation of the DA that would have gone on exhibition? Yeah, so I just looked at the public, publicly available notification plans and they appear to be on there, but I, I can double check that with the admin staff, if that's, oh, that's the okay. correct uh, set that would notify. So you, you're basically, from what you know, it was part of the package of the development application that went on exhibition? Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I've got no further questions, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the Chain Valley Bay matter. Um, all of the people who are registered to speak are on behalf of the applicant, um, and some of them just want to answer questions. But if, if there are any of you who do want to speak, you've got a total of 15 minutes for all of you put together, um, and I'll let whoever it is that's the nominated spokesperson kick off. Yeah, thanks, Donna. I'll uh, I'll go. Um, my name's Joe War. I'm the uh, head of planning with Hometown Australia. Um, uh, given there's no other speakers today, um, really we're here today to answer any questions of the panel. Um, but I will start by saying that um, the the council recommendation that's before the panel is an accurate reflection of the commitments we've made um, throughout this development process. It is the culmination of over two and a half years of detailed reporting, and we're proud of the outcomes that, that have been presented, um, in particular, um, as the council officer's report demonstrates, um, you know, we've been able to demonstrate that the impacts of the proposal are not serious and irreversible, and that's um, largely due to our commitment uh, and acquisition of Lot 22, um, which, which as, as noted, has provided will provide benefit to local biodiversity. Um, other key highlights for us include uh, confirmation uh, from Council and RFS that the development meets bushfire protection requirements. We've incorporated some significant protections for existing residents in there, uh, as well as future residents. Um, the development, as noted, won't have significant impact on the existing road network and it has support from both Council and Traffic for New South Wales as documented in the Council report. Um, and, and importantly, we've, as always, 
confirmed that this development will achieve a high level of amenity for our residents uh, and, and it is a suitable use for the site. Uh, in, in regards to the conditions, um, we are satisfied. I'm satisfied that they are, are clear, measurable and achievable. Um, they will allow hometown to, to deliver on our commitments and they give us clear parameters for timing and reporting. Uh, and on this basis, we accept the conditions without amendment. Uh, hometown, by way of background, as an experienced development team, we've developed more than 400 new dwellings within existing communities like Draglin. Uh, we own and operate 57 communities across three states. And right now we are developing within eight communities, just like Draglin. Um, so we are we have a highly experienced development team that is able to deliver. Uh, and we do have a full comprehensive understanding of our compliance obligations, in particular local government act regulations, um, and everything is understood. Um, uh, within the framework of, of the council recommendations. Uh, so look, we, we've got a team, our, our consultants are online today. So if you want to ask us any further questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, and I'm also available to answer questions. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, and nobody else wants to say anything at this stage, no? No, not at this stage, thanks, Donna, no. Thank you. All right, members of the panel, who wants to go first? Um, no at all. Greg, where you go? Uh, I really only wanted to ask uh, if you've got a you got a drainage engineer available, flooding engineer, drainage engineer. Uh, yes, I believe Jason and Jason is our civil engineer. We've got Nets. Uh, okay. I believe I saw his name on there on the call. If I could just ask Jason, Jason, um, condition two point one three talks about the erection of a flood berm proposed in the eastern boundary of lot. Um, one, which is number two, I presume. So it's it's going to be inside that property, and then there'll be a right of two rights of way, and then there's another adjoining property to the east. Right. Um, I was just wondering that condition. Um, why why is it required, and what are the impacts of a basically a berm, which which it would act like a retarding basin or a retention basin in types of heavy rain and flooding, wouldn't it? So the berm, and, and would there be any impacts on the both rights of way and, and the adjoining property? Yep. So the berm is there to act to direct flow to the low point. Um, the low point being in one location where we've proposed an inlet, yeah. a stormwater okay. inlet. And we have some uh, significantly sized box culverts going underneath the proposed development to convey the flows. Um, where that low point is, We've done some additional, or well, we're proposing to do some additional work on battle axe handle for lot 22 um, to allow, to make sure that there is an access through that is completely flood free. And we've proven that with the flood modeling we've done. And, and, and so, sorry, the, the battle axe handle for lot 21 is unaffected from current situation. But the berm, I, I saw some of the drawings that it had a berm created, but it looks like, unless it's got a flash retaining wall along the, um, right of way, it would have to be constructed across the boundary, wouldn't it? No, at this point, it's proposed to be completely within the- Okay. And, and so it's a directional thing rather than any sort of retardation. So in high Correct. types of rain, the system has capacity to make sure the water just goes straight into the bay. Right. So yeah, so the culverts, um, the inlet and the culverts have been sized for the 100 year. The, in the event that there's a, a severe blockage, 100% blockage of the culverts, the levels of all the dwellings have been proposed above that uh, level. So if it, if it, the inlet blocks, water builds up, it goes down the road out the front of some of these proposed dwellings, and those dwellings are above that level as well. Okay, so, so absolutely. There's definitely no right. impacts then on adjoining properties potentially. Correct. Okay. All right, I've got no further questions. Chair. Thank you, Greg. Um, Lynn or Stephen? Nothing, uh, for me. Nothing for you, Lynn. Thank you. Okay, Stephen. That was basically the only issue I think we sort of had that was. Um, it was outstanding other than whether they wanted to just comment about the time. I know the application was lodged um, early last year by the looks of it and we're sort of midway through the next year and we've got a report coming up to us. Do you, have you got any sort of explanation as to why why that's occurred? I do know there's been some, some RFIs issued on uh, biodiversity issues. Just leaving it open to you to make any comments about that as the applicant. 
Oh, look, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, as you noted, and as the report notes, there, I think there was about six RFIs throughout the process, um, which, you know, we we replied to in, in you know, as quickly as we could. But, um, oh, look, it, it's, um, no, look, I mean, we're, we're satisfied with the recommendations um, we've got there in the end. The very strategic response. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, does anybody, anyone else from the panel have any last questions for, for the, all of these people that have kindly um, turned up this afternoon? No? Okay. All right. Well, um, that's it for all of our speakers. Um, what we will do now is um, we will close this public meeting and move into our deliberative meeting um, and given that we're doing all of this electronically, the, our plan is to have um, our decisions up on Council's website as soon as we possibly can. Um, we, we might make a decision, we might um, defer if we need more information, you know, that's the typically the sorts of things that can happen. Um, but the only thing that's left for me to do at this stage is to thank everybody who attended this afternoon and took part in the meeting. Um, including, of course, the, the panel members, um, the members of the community, the applicants' representatives, and um, all of the people from council. Thank you very much. And members of the panel, if we could be back on at, um, on the link for the deliberative meeting at 2.45, um, then we'll, we'll move into that stage. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.